However, when Jai Wan inquires about the reason, Carlton cites the governing rule that prohibits such actions. This rule also grants him the authority to command everyone in the vicinity to kneel, known as the Gorgon Restraint Act. Yet, with a swift swing of his sword, Jai Wan breaks free, expressing his disinterest in Carlton's rule or any official certification. He confidently asserts that he can prove his identity without it. Despite Jai Wan's defiance, Carlton pays him no heed and invokes another legal provision, summoning a white chain in an attempt to restrain Jai Wan. Once again, Jai Wan effortlessly frees himself from the chain, leaving everyone astonished. Eventually, Jai Wan inquires if he can follow Mino's example with the captain. This statement unnerves James, causing him to pale as he fears exposure. Unperturbed by the onlookers and Mino, Jai Wan casually tosses an item to Carlton. Upon noticing the item, James shouts at Jai Wan, accusing him of attempting to bribe the chief and suggesting that he should face execution. However, Carlton intervenes, stating that he has been awaiting Jai Wan. Checking Mino's soul corruption status, the devices advise her to take medication urgently as her soul corruption has surpassed 15%. She then clarifies that soul corruption is a chronic ailment affecting everyone living in chaos. Just existing in chaos gradually taints one's soul. This is why horned monsters are treasured by the people in chaos, as their horns serve as the only remedy to reduce soul corruption. Carlton proceeds to assess Jay Wan's soul, but the device fails to measure his soul corruption level, displaying 0%. Carlton <laughs> smiles and returns the item Jay Wan had given him. He warns Jay Wan not to readily hand over a soul stone to anyone, referring to him as the messenger of the Nok Myong. Jai Wan, however, asserts that he doesn't belong to the Nok Myong, a fact Carlton is already aware of. Carlton elaborates that a soul stone is a valuable object amplifying spiritual power, but it's not that straightforward. Holding it for a short time causes Carlton's hand to become entirely corrupted. Only members of the Nok Myong can handle the soul stone without succumbing to corruption. Despite Jai Wan's non-membership in the Nok Myong, Carlton has faith in Jai Wan's soul. He explains that the device can't measure Jai Wan's soul because it's the purest among all the souls in chaos. As Carlton and James enter the fortress, it seems James's nightmare of the dream demon is coming true. Carlton mentions there is someone at the gate who permits entry in exchange for a bribe. Meanwhile, in the village, Jai Wan reflects on how things have become overly complicated. He's burdened by Carlton's punishment of Mino under the law for not carrying her identification certificate leaving her a mindless follower. He inquires with the villagers about a skilled blacksmith who can work on swords, drawing attention to his spirit weapon. As they approach a tunnel, Mino awakens, and Jai Wan suggests she continue on her own path. She refuses, believing he's still upset about her attempt to leave him at the gate, which she meant as a joke. Jai Wan insists it's for her own good, as he's being guided to the castle now, and she would only be a hindrance. Recognizing their differences, he urges her to go her own way. However, like a couple in an argument, Mino decides to follow him, asking if he even knows where he's going. Looking at her, Jai Wan reveals his intent to find the Dream Demon. It turns out she might know a place where he could be, and they agree to go there. But first, they need to deal with the people trailing them. Some individuals have business with them. A group of tough individuals approaches Jai Wan, demanding he surrender his sword. Jai Wan stands his ground, refusing their request. Meanwhile, Mino becomes increasingly irritated with the youngest thug, who is also the largest in the group. Jai Wan reaches his limit with their behavior and warns them by aiming his sword just above the group. Frustrated, Jai Wan challenges them to attack him all at once. The gang leader is angry that his youngest member was injured, and orders a coordinated assault on Jai Wan, but Jai Wan refrains from killing them. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. What is your favorite Manwa storyline, and why? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. Instead, he rendered them unconscious. Mino playfully questioned if he possessed any other techniques apart from thrusting. Jai Wan admitted he didn't, dedicating 15 years to mastering that single move. Later, Mino inquired why Jai Wan had missed his thrust earlier resulting in the roof exploding. Jay Wan disclosed that he had detected someone employing a secret skill on the roof and had decided to give them a little scare due to annoyance. After a while, they reached the blacksmith shop named Twilight's Descent. A youthful and robust apprentice welcomed them and informed them of their busy schedule. Even if they placed an order today, it would require some time. Inside, the apprentices eagerly eyed a sword crafted from a quadhorn's horn offering to work on the gem slot. The one who succeeded would become the acting owner for the day. The shop's proprietor, Michael, granted them the opportunity, but despite their best efforts, they couldn't even scratch the sword. Michael scolded his apprentices, but Jai Wan decided to take a shot. Michael underestimated him, 
but Jai Wan used his pointed finger to pierce the small sword, creating a hole in it. He twirled it around and proudly declared himself the acting owner for the day. However, as Jai Wan continued to toy with the sword, it suddenly disintegrated into fragments, leaving everyone in the shop stunned and Michael furious. His anger wasn't just because of the destruction but also due to the exorbitant cost of the horn material. Jai Huan furrowed his brow and expressed regret for his error, acknowledging that he had failed to break only the necessary part and instead shattered the entire thing. Michael seethed and demanded compensation for the valuable material. Jai Wan produced a pentahorn, and Michael accepted it, even blushing at the sight of the massive horn. Michael then ordered his apprentices to close the door and led Jai Wan to his personal forge, boasting that it was the finest facility in the entire Gorgon region. Jai Wan revealed another pentahorn, indicating that he possessed more than one. However, this puzzled Michael. Furthermore, Jai Wan intended to craft a scabbard from it. Given that it was a pentahorn, the material appeared excessive for a mere scabbard. Jai Wan lent him the sword, and after examining its properties, Michael groaned, Ah, uh, the Frost Dragon Sword. Nevertheless, he lamented that this sword was only a replica. The sword began to emit a mournful sound. Michael dropped it in shock, and it landed on top of the Garnick's horn. The sword then vibrated even more intensely as it opened its mouth and began consuming the horn. Now Michael realized it was a spirit weapon. The Frost Dragon Sword gleamed after finishing its meal of the Garnax horn. He remarked on witnessing many intriguing things today and noted that the sword was evolving. However, they no longer possessed the material as it had been consumed by the sword. Jay Wan reassured, it's all right, and produced another one from his backpack. Michael stood before the Garnax horn as it marked his first opportunity to work on one. So Michael inquired how he could assist Jai Wan in shaping or crafting it. Jai Wan replied that he would entrust it to Michael, though he appeared surprised. Declaring himself the Master of Dawn, he pledged to show Jai Wan his capabilities. Simultaneously, inside Gorgon Castle, a middle-aged gentleman in tidy, formal attire cleared his throat while sipping his tea. The individual in dark attire respectfully lowered his head as he knelt before the middle-aged man. He reported the unfortunate loss of their target, expressing his confusion about his team's defeat. He had been rendered unconscious and had awoken on a rooftop. The person in the black robe was a third-stage adapter. When a third-stage adapter possessed a master-level, high-ranking stealth skill and was in concealment, even higher-ranking adapters had difficulty detecting them. Nevertheless, the target had located him and swiftly incapacitated him without his knowledge. The middle-aged man speculated that the target might be at the fifth stage, indicating the need for preparedness. He emphasized their determination to assemble a larger group and locate him, regardless of the cost. At that moment, a deep thud emanated from the underground cell beneath the castle. Although it was a subtle tremor, the middle-aged man, a high-ranked adapter, sensed it. Subsequently, he heard a faint, prolonged scream from below and furrowed his brow. Master, please endure a bit longer. The following day, within the tavern, middle-aged individuals engaged in lively conversation. At the center, an antiquated holographic device displayed a broadcast, featuring a pink-haired girl with a small horn. The video showcased a man engaged in a solo battle against a colossal frost dragon. The man relentlessly thrust his weapon, concealing his identity. The tavern patrons grew increasingly restless, their curiosity piqued by the spectacle. Abruptly, the tavern door swung open, and Mino made her entrance. She confidently took a seat at the bar, drawing the attention of the men with her slender figure and fair complexion. Mino exuded an eerie and unsettling aura that sent shivers down the spines of those present. Some of the men grew fearful and hastily exited the tavern. Mino couldn't help but bitterly chuckle as she thought of Jai Wan, the individual who had introduced her to this chaotic world. She took a long sip of her drink, attempting to drown her sorrows. Aunt Claire, the proprietor of the tavern, appeared and scolded Mino for driving away customers. In her inebriated state, Mino mumbled incomprehensibly. Aunt Claire was familiar with Mino's temperament, having met her at the Tower of Night the Dream Demons, and understood that Mino had a fiery disposition and a tendency for mischief. While not a malevolent person, Trouble seemed to follow her everywhere, and Claire sighed and cautioned Mino to steer clear of Jai Wan, whom she regarded as dangerous. Before Mino could respond, a message composed of spiritual energy pierced through the window and reached her. It was from Carlton, the Northern Gate Captain. Mino felt an ominous pressure closing in from all sides. One of the men approached her and inquired, Are you the Witch of Massacre? In her drunken haze, Mino retrieved a dagger from her attire. The man grinned ominously and informed her that they required her assistance. Meanwhile, back at the forge, Michael had resigned from crafting the horn, deeming the material too advanced for his skills. Jai Huan in his wisdom placed his hand over Michael's eyes and emphasized the importance of perception. Michael's eyes emitted a radiant glow, and the material before him began to undergo a transformation. Suddenly, Michael found himself in an alternate realm, 
where he could discern the true nature of the material. It assumed the form of a menacing monster that launched an assault. Jai Wan encouraged Michael to concentrate, reminding him of his commitment to assist. Terrified, Michael believed it was just a nightmare and frantically sought an escape route. He ran away, leaving Jai Wan feeling let down. Upon opening the door, hoping for assistance, Michael was met with a terrifying sight. His supposed apprentices had transformed into skeletons, inquiring about the completion of their work. In a panic, Michael encountered another being who labeled him foolish and unworthy of glimpsing what lay beyond. Armed only with a hammer and chisel, he confronted the menacing creatures devoid of any expertise. The creature attacked Jay Wan, and he fought back. Their battle was intense, with the creature howling and bleeding, seemingly reveling in the combat. Amid the turmoil, Michael observed in astonishment and trepidation. Ultimately, Jay Wan shattered the horn, and they began discussing a past event linked to the owner of the blacksmith shop. Jai Wan touched the broken horn, and something remarkable occurred before Michael's eyes. The particles touched by Jai Wan's finger vanished, as if consumed by an unseen force. Jai Wan shook his head, and Michael leaned in for a closer look. It brought back memories of his youth, when his mentor had told him he couldn't surpass human limits, further fueling his determination to become akin to the dream demons. Michael inquired of Jai Wan what steps he should take to challenge the world. Jai Wan advised him to scrutinize carefully and not rely on the system, but to trust his own eyes. It was then that Michael beheld a world he believed shouldn't exist. As Jai Wan charged at the spirit beast, Michael was inspired to pick up his chisel once more. With unwavering resolve, he began crafting the horn anew. Several hours later, they finally completed the scabbard for the spirit sword. Jai Wan decided to christen the awakened spirit sword Lone Wolf and engraved it on the scabbard. They bid each other farewell, and Michael asked Jai Wan how he perceived him. Jai Wan replied that Michael appeared human, but Michael realized Jai Wan could see beyond the surface, perceiving that amidst the chaos, everyone resembled skeletons. As he strolled through the town, Mino returned, following him. She openly admitted her plan to take Jay Wan's spirit stones and even harm him. As a peace offering, she handed him a bag of clothes and inquired about his intentions. Jai Wan knew how to approach the dream demon and seek information about the illusion tree in the abyss. He asserted that he had no intention of going back, emphasizing his humanity. This infuriated Mino, who questioned his audacity and pointed out that the people of Chaos were also human, even if they lacked Jai Wan's courage. However, the unchanging truth was that the world they knew revolved around numbers and data, where some were willing to sacrifice their souls to gain power. At that moment, Mino broke through the barrier and asked Jai Wan if she appeared human. She bid him farewell, promising they would never meet again, and her appearance transformed to that of a human. While the people of Chaos were believed to be deceased souls from the tower, Jai Wan was different. He had pushed beyond the limits of human capability, shattering the tower's constraints to reach chaos. Returning to the bar, Mino wondered how things had taken such a turn as she opened the door. The bar was in ruins, and inside, a group of people awaited her, holding Claire hostage. They were members of the Forbidden Heaven Clan, led by the elder named Janya. He questioned Mino's return alone, prompting her to draw her dagger, doubting if he'd ever seen a witch keep her word. She asserted that someone wouldn't be coming back and attack them, claiming that this individual would only bring chaos to chaos. Janya remarked on her supposed insanity. Releasing his shadow to engage her, she easily defeated their adversaries. During their clash, Janya managed to strike her, injuring her further, all while Claire remained held hostage. In her final attempt, Mino unleashed her ultimate attack, hurling eight daggers simultaneously. Yet Janya effortlessly countered each one, commenting on the elegance of her techniques. He then threatened to deal with her personally, and she collapsed, losing consciousness. The only thing she could recall was Jay Wan, and now she yearned to return to the past and follow him. She lamented the unfolding situation as Janya prepared to strike her with his sword. Suddenly, an attack came from the sky, which Janya defended with his sword. Jai Wan appeared, standing beside Mino, and she questioned why he was there instead of bringing about the world's destruction. Jai Wan explained that the clothes she had given him didn't fit, so he returned them. Meanwhile, Janya realized that Jai Wan was the one who had taken the spirit stones, and his men chuckled at the thought that Jai Wan had saved them the trouble of searching for him. Jai Wan asked Janya if they were the ones associated with the Dream Demon, and requested that they summon the Dream Demon to their location. Janya believes that Jai Wan might be insane, because Mino tells him that Janya is a highly skilled fighter. Now they gather together and confront Jai Wan, telling him they will teach him a lesson. Although Jai Wan attempts to attack Janya, he manages to evade the blows. Realizing that Janya can't defeat Jai Wan, he takes Claire hostage. Mino pleads with Jai Wan to save her, but it only confuses him. 
He believes he must eliminate anyone in his path. Mino holds him back, and Claire cries out, revealing her humanity. Jay Wan is momentarily surprised. As he observes their true nature, Claire urges him to start fighting. Ultimately, Jay Wan strikes the ceiling, creating a beam of light that shoots into the sky. This action also destroys the protective barrier they had set up, alerting the guards and Gorgon. At that moment, Carlton arrives with his men, greets Jai Wan, and asks for an explanation. Jai Wan explains that Janya is violating the law and planning to use the bar as a base to destroy the world by conspiring with the Dream Demon. However, Jai Wan is the one who truly aims to bring about chaos. Instantly, Carlton uses his authority and silver restraints to take control. He summons an axe of authority to apprehend the wrongdoer, stating that further resistance is futile. However, Janya doesn't give up. He charges forward and strikes Carlton with his sword, creating a shockwave that echoes throughout the bar. Janya's sword, however, cracks upon meeting Carlton's light axe. Unfazed, he leaps with all his might to attack Carlton once more. In the end, Carlton employs the chain of light again, effortlessly defeating Janya. Moments later, with the axe at Janya's throat, he surrenders. Janya mentions that he heard Carlton is as idealistic as he is righteous. Then, Janya throws a poison gas bomb in the bar. As they manage to exit, he comments on not expecting to use the Black Cloud indoors. With his allies in tow, they attempt to escape. Suddenly, Clan Elder Silong appears and questions whether the Witch of Massacre is so powerful that Janya had to resort to the Black Cloud. Janya reveals that the Silver Restraint has been activated, and at that moment, Jai Wan, Mino, and Carlton are inside. Shortly after, Seilong spots Jai Wan bringing Mino out of the bar and requests information about Jai Huan. He also notices the group of four from the Forbidden Heaven Clan and lightly confronts them. Janya informs him that he is also curious about Jai Huan. The fact that Jai Huan remains unharmed after encountering the Black Cloud surprises them, and they have never encountered an emerald bug without antennae. Jai Huan seats Mino, glances at the Forbidden Heaven Clan, and finds them troublesome to deal with. With that idea in mind, he plunged his scabbard into the ground, using its magic to summon Garnak's spirit. The spirit, filled with anger, rushes toward them like lightning. With a quick move, it defeats the two Forbidden Heaven followers. Only Seo Lang and Jai Huan remain. Seo Lang is impressed by Jai Huan's strength and runs off, leaving Jai Huan to face Janya. His dear comrades Jan Mion and Jan Mong are his only companions now, and it seems like this could be the end. But Jai Wan proposes a way for Janya to survive, and demands to know where the hidden dream demon is. Janya hesitates, fearing that revealing the secret will cost him his life. Ultimately, he decides to spill the secret, knowing that his fate is sealed either way. He consumes a spirit stone, and a dark, corrupting force turns him into a gigantic monster that towers over nearby houses. People call it the dead, as it goes on a rampage its claws draining the life force from anyone unfortunate enough to cross its path. In this monstrous form, Janya glimpses the brutal reality of the chaotic world he once knew. He ponders the concept of honor in such a world, and even finds some comfort in facing his impending end. Suddenly, he senses Jai Wan's presence, and turns to call him out for his stealthy approach. Janya is puzzled by Jai Wan's presence as a mere human in this chaotic realm. Meanwhile, Jai Wan is equally baffled by Janya's resistance to his power. Question. Nevertheless, he doesn't waste any time and swiftly beheads the monster with a precise strike. Jai Wan feels disappointed. He needed someone from the bar who knew the Dream Demon's whereabouts. He decides to return to Mino. Shortly after, they manage to rescue Mino and Carlton from the perilous Black Cloud. Sadly, Mino's health deteriorated rapidly due to the soul corruption. Carlton instructed his men to notify the Inner Fortress, while Mino asked Jai Wan to grant her a merciful end while she was still herself. Jai Wan discovered that Mino was, in fact, a human being, as his comprehendability failed to work on her. He pondered why his questionability faltered when used on her, and why the dead crumbled. Despite his mission's emotionless nature, he resolved to fulfill Mino's request. However, Claire intervened, urging Jai Wan to wait a little longer, suggesting that there might still be time to save her. As the day progressed, they set up a camp to contain the spreading soul corruption in Mino and Carlton. Meanwhile, chaos engulfed the town as small, dead creatures emerged within the fortress. Panic ensued as people rushed to seek safety, following the evacuation orders. A man with blonde hair approached a guard, seeking guidance on finding a safe haven, only to reveal that he too had succumbed to the dead. In a gruesome instant, the dead's tentacles claimed his life. Another small dead drew nearer to the terrified townsfolk, eager to drain their life force. From the rooftops of nearby houses, a group of courageous individuals leaped into action, prepared to confront the approaching small dead creatures directly. In the blink of an eye, they vanquished the dead, saving the people from being consumed. Right beside them, a formidable protector emerged, ready to shield the people. Meanwhile, Jai Wan anxiously awaited Mino's return. He gazed out at chaos, a world he saw as a graveyard for those who had perished in the tower. 
destined to become nourishment for the Tree of Life, including Mino. Claire, with her exceptional insight into people, firmly believed that no one in Chaos possessed the courage to defy their grim fate. She asserted that Jaiwan posed a danger. While Mino hoped Jaiwan would stay, Claire insisted that he must depart, as his presence offered hope and his absence would plunge people further into despair. However, Mino disagreed, wishing for Jaiwan to persevere in this world. Amidst all this, Carlton's condition deteriorated, and James ordered the guards to procure all available medicine to stabilize him. Time was running out for both Mino and Carlton. They resorted to grinding a horn from a horned beast into a powder for Carlton to ingest, even though it couldn't fully cleanse his corrupted soul. Jaiwan approached James, inquiring if there was any way to reverse Carlton's transformation into a dead, James, agitated, regretted allowing Jaiwan into their midst. Ignoring the captain, Jaiwan slapped Carlton in an attempt to awaken him. Astonishingly, Carlton awoke and asked Jaiwan to end his life, a testament to his unwavering loyalty, leaving Jaiwan deeply moved, thinking about how valuable such allies would have been during his 40 years in the tower. An alert sounded, indicating that Carlton's soul corruption had reached 94% and the deadification process was imminent. Simultaneously, a high-level adapter named Johir, the Demon Extermination Squad captain, arrived at the camp, a fifth-stage adapter. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out Probnorsing3928, who commented, Rimuru Tempest Veldora Sword on our Wanted to be a Hero, but ended up as a villain video. Thanks for commenting. Johir fearlessly announces his plan to eliminate Carlton and Mino, leaving Captain James astonished. As Jahir prepares to strike with his sword, Jaiwan effortlessly stops it with his bare hand, vowing to protect them and seeking answers. Though Jahir seems composed, he's secretly unsettled by Jaiwan's remarkable feat. Jaiwan then produces a Garnark's horn, crushing it into powder with his bare hand, compelling both Carlton and Jahir to ingest it. It turns out that James has a sentimental attachment to his gate manager, and is relieved that the measuring device has stopped changing. However, Mino isn't as fortunate. Her deadification is rapidly progressing due to her weakened stamina, her soul corruption has exceeded 95%, and there's no way to halt the progression. Jahare attempts to get closer, eager to end Mino's life, especially after Claire mentions the old geezer who can perform the dead slash. Jawan, aware of this, explains that the slash only removes corruption and asks the squad to take Mino away. Jahira insists on proceeding, demanding Jawan step aside. He unsheathes his sword, intending to kill Mino as she had requested earlier. Claire desperately shouts from behind, urging Jaiwan to reconsider, but Jaiwan ignores her and uses his question on Mino. Beams of light emanate from her chest where Jaiwan's sword touches, transporting Jaiwan to another world, leaving him puzzled by the turn of events. In this realm, he encounters an old man who expresses sorrow over Mino's condition. As the old man turns toward Jaiwan, he's surprised to see him there and questions his presence in his world. Jaiwan attempts to use question on the old man, but it proves ineffective. Ultimately, he deduces that the old man is the source of Mino's soul corruption and rushes toward him. The old man reacts and manages to thwart Jaiwan's slight stab. Moments later, the scene dissolves as both Jaiwan and the old man return to the real world. Jaha recognizes the old man and demands an explanation for his presence. The old man is furious, accusing Jaiwan of intruding upon his world and breaking his sword. It is revealed that the old man is Cheong Heo, the despair divine physician. Jahir questions why Cheong Heo is here, instead of aiding the fortress master. Cheong Heo responds that a beautiful woman's life is at stake, and it doesn't matter if he's with the fortress master or not. Cheong Heo is furious with Jai Hwan, because his dead slash, meant to purge the corruption, was disrupted due to Jai Hwan's interference. The dead slash can only be performed with a sword made of trihorn or higher. Realizing that Jai Hwan possesses a scabbard made of Garnak's horn, Chongyo circles around him, requesting to borrow it for the dead slash. This surprises Chongyo, as he interprets Jaiwan's willingness to lend the sword to a stranger as a sign of confidence in his own abilities. But for now, Chongyo is focused on entering his own world once again, eager to discover the sword's potential. In that moment, Jaiwan finds himself stepping into the world the old man envisions, wondering if it's a clever illusion or something akin to Jaiwan's question ability. Cheong Heo rushes ahead, and Jaiwan realizes it's the same world the old man has envisioned. After the tension-filled moments, the old man stumbles and blames the troublesome fortress master for his low spirit power. The world he has drawn begins to crumble, and Mino's image fades away. In response, Jaiwan apologizes and grasps his sword, attempting the technique. The old man isn't pleased, thinking Jaiwan is acting recklessly, a sentiment echoed by Claire. Jaiwan silences them as the old man's world becomes Jaiwan's canvas, explaining that it's the first time he's ever used his sword to save someone. This revelation surprises the old man, 
and Jaiwan begins to recreate Mino from his memories. She's playful, stubborn, and somewhat fragile, despite being an assassin. She's loyal, trustworthy, yet something about her feels incomplete. Most importantly, she trusts others. As the world dissolves, Mino expresses her gratitude to Jai Huan for recalling all the good things about her. Smiling warmly at the person she shares a love-hate relationship with, Jaha, unable to perceive their crafted world, notices that the deadification is ceasing, leaving him speechless. The old man commends Jai Huan, and for now he regards Jai Huan more favorably. He dubs the technique Jai Huan used the dead stab, reluctantly admitting that Jai Huan can employ it to eliminate soul corruption. Cheong Heo elaborates that Jai Huan's dead slash is not just a skill, which is why no one in chaos can master it. He theorizes that Jai Huan is more akin to a divine healer, an awakened. They clarify that an awakened is someone who operates outside the standard rules of the system, they are a rare subset among humans who gain extraordinary strength after rejecting the system's adaptation. These individuals possess the ability to completely disrupt Chaos's established hierarchy of power. Even in the vast expanse of the Almighty Land, there are only a handful of recognized awakened. This excites Jahir as he envisions the possibility of someone capable of performing a technique to eliminate soul corruption and save the Fortress Master. Simultaneously, another group from the Fortress arrives stating they have received permission from the Inner Fortress authorities to step aside. The leader of this group is the Dark Shadow Squad Captain, a Stage 5 Adapter. The Captain pays respects to Jai Wan, who is mistakenly believed to be the emissary of the Emerald Bug, and requests him to follow into the Inner Fortress. A short while later, within the Fortress, Jai Wan finally encounters Cheever, the individual responsible for internal affairs at the Gorgon Fortress. Jai Wan then reveals that he is not the emissary of the Emerald Bug, surprising the Shadow Squad captain. However, he discloses that he killed the actual emissary of the Emerald Bug and retrieved the Spirit Stone from them. This news agitates the others, but Cheever urges them to remain calm and asks Jai Wan to provide a detailed account of what transpired after he entered Chaos. In short, Jai Wan stumbled into Chaos by chance and obtained a Spirit Stone from the Emerald Bug Clan, allowing him to enter Gorgon Fortress. By another stroke of luck, he encountered the Divine Physician, and learned the Divine Physician's deadly slash technique after witnessing it just once. Cheong Heo questions the credibility of this story, but Cheever insists he believes it, which might sound a bit crazy. Cheever emphasizes that to gain someone's trust, you must first trust them. He then asks a surprising question. Is Jai Wan's current body alive? This astonishes Jai Wan, who thought he didn't enter the tower and came out of the Tower of Night the Dream Demon by destroying it. Consequently, he exists in a soul form and it's likely that the illusion tree mistook him for a deceased being, sending him to chaos, with his physical body possibly still on Earth. Jai Wan inquires how Cheever knows he's not dead. Cheever explains that no one in chaos would describe their own death the way Jai Wan did. He also asks if Jai Wan is keeping his identity hidden, because he's being threatened by someone, to which Jai Wan denies. In the end, Cheever apologizes to Jai Wan, admitting that he's had his subordinates monitor him for the past four days something Jai Wan already suspected. Cheever adds that they found out Jai Wan is much more powerful than they initially thought. Despite the difficulty in monitoring him, they did gather valuable information. Jai Wan's danger level is rated SS, his power level is incalculable, and he's caused approximately 380 million horns worth of damage. Finally, Cheever asks if Jai Wan knows what people call someone like him. Cheong Heo exclaims that he's a madman, and Jai Heer agrees, uncertain if Jai Wan is a hero or a villain. Cheever, however, states that people might see Jai Wan as a hero or a lunatic, giving him various nicknames. But to Cheever, individuals like Jai Wan are called protagonists. He mentions that there's a unique trait shared by characters like Jai Wan, namely their fame. However, Jai Wan isn't famous at all, implying that someone has concealed his information from the public. This suggests that a powerful entity is hostile toward Jai Wan, or they wouldn't have tampered with his identification documents. He discloses that Jai Wan is a protagonist being pursued by a formidable force. This also coincidentally led him to chaos by sheer luck. Jai Wan ponders for a moment about the powerful entity chasing him. While he's uncertain, he suspects it might be the person known as the Monarch of Darkness. He's left wondering about the strength of these monarchs. He queries Cheever about the Gorgon Fortress Master's capability to contend with the twelve Almighty Land Monarchs. Cheever is relieved because if one of these monarchs is chasing Jai Wan, they won't be able to meddle in Chaos's affairs. Jai Huan then asks what they want in return. Cheever replies that Jai Huan only needs to do one favor for them, to save the Fortress Master. Two hours later, Jai Huan is guided to the training room within the castle dungeon. It's revealed that the Northern Inspection Gate Captain and Mino 
are recuperating in the treatment center. The guide is puzzled as to why they want to go to the training ground instead of the VIP room. Chung Heo responds that they need to determine which is more powerful, Jo Wan's dead trusts or the divine physician's dead slash. Chung Heo also inquires if Jae Wan has cleared the master's tower. Jae Wan learns that Chung Heo knows something about it, but will only reveal it after Jae Wan beats the divine physician. He adds that it's probably an impossible task for Jae Wan. A little later, from beneath the ground, Chung Heo challenges Jae Wan to another fight. The training ground is already in disarray, and Jae Wan claims that the outcome has already been decided. However, the old man insists that he hasn't yet employed his ultimate technique expressing concern that Jai Wan might die if he uses it. He then asks Jai Wan's age, to which Jai Wan replies around 60 years. This prompts Cheong Heo to exclaim that he's already a thousand years old, and asserts that a mere 60 years of experience couldn't possibly compete against his thousand years of expertise. Jai Wan teases him, claiming that, in his opinion, it seems like the elderly gentleman has only been doing it for a decade. This infuriates the elderly man, and he emerges from his spot, eager to see if Jae Wan still feels the same way after experiencing his punch. Employing his powerful slashing move, he directs his most potent strike at Jae Wan, unleashing a fierce, tiger-like energy from his blade. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps.